Welcome to module 2 of object oriented analysis and design course. In module 1, we have set the stage for the requirements of OOAD. We have seen that uh, uh, software development is still at a nascent stage and has a long way to go for confirmed success of projects and to achieve a status of a proper field of engineering, which can guarantee correct construction, timely completion of projects and uh, within budget delivery and so on. In this module, we look at what is the complexity of software. That is, we take a look at why software is complex and to analyze little bit more, we try to understand the elements of the complexity of a software. This is the outline and as I have already meant, uh, mentioned earlier, you will be able to see this outline on the left bar throughout. Okay. So, before we start to take a look into the complexity of software, let us uh, first try to understand what do we refer to as software. There has to be a I mean this is just clarifying the jargon, clarifying the understanding. So, software as we know is a, you can always simplify and say that uh, anything that we say is a software is finally, a program which takes inputs and generates output, which is, which is a quite a simplistic straightforward view of software. But we all know that software gets lot more complex than that. So, here for the purpose of this course, we look at, we divide the software of the world in two buckets. One we say are personal or limited use software, the other we say is industrial strength software. So, let me just quickly explain what these mean. The personal or limited use software has a limited set of behavior. It is not very complex and most importantly, it is specified constructed, maintained and use possibly by the same person or at most by a very small group. For example, uh, I, I, I recall uh, about uh, 10, 15 years back uh, while working on a project, uh, three of us faced with the problem that uh, at those days there used to be floppy drives, they used to be very, very small. So, when we wanted to copy one uh, big file from one system to the other, it did not fit into one floppy. So, what we needed is to divide that binary file into 4, 5, 10 different floppies, then copy each one into a single floppy, take that to the other system, copy back and then merge that 10 different parts together into one. Now, this is something which was required, which is a engineering requirement of the setup that we had. So, ma we struggled in doing those, this is, that was not the day when you could just go to Google and type and get a free software, which has, which somebody has written for you. So, we sat down and wrote a program in C, I remember, and which will take a binary file, divide it into as many parts as you want, then copy them one by one into different floppies and then you take those floppies, copy the individual parts and again another part of that program will combine them together. So, this also this is a software, this this had functionality, this has uh, um, uh, this uh, served us for about 3, 4 years quite effectively and uh, all, all of us some 4, 5 of us in the group used to regularly use that. Now, this is a kind of software which we will say is a personal or limited use software, because th as I described the behavior is quite simple, it is not complex at all, it is done by a small group ourselves. Uh, kind of this group is amateur programmer, we were not exactly amateur programmer, but we are professional developers working in isolation, not as a part of a big team and such software tend to have a short life span. And uh, of course, once or twice we uh, needed to make changes, we did that ourselves and such software since they are not very complex, no, has not been done with a lot of effort. So, it is possible that when they get dated it is possible to scrap them and write new software all over again. 
or make major changes, you do not have to worry about a lot of investment already existing in this software. So, that somehow even though the functionality is not matching exactly of what you need today, you will still need to continue to use that and bend backwards to write some more wrappers, some more plugins to make that old software, the decaying legacy software to work under the present conditions. So, these such softwares may be often may be more tedious, but they are not very difficult to build. And the reason I characterize this software is we will not be concerned with, we will not talk about uh, the development of such software in this course. This is not of much interest. What we are interested in is what uh, we call is industrial strength software. Industrial strength software does not mean software that needs to be used in an industry. It is showing that the kind of strength that it shows is what industry would typically use. Now, some of the characteristics would be it the software exhibits a very rich set of behavior. For example, it could be reactive systems that drive or are driven by events in the physical world. For example, you may be aware that a large number of uh, cars today, when you brake, press the brake, actually the brake happens through a software. It is there is no direct shaft which connects the pedal that you are pushing at the brake and the shoes that press against the tires, the rim of the tire. So, these are these are different reactive systems that are driven by the events in the physical world. Second typical characteristic would be these software work with scarce resources. By scarce resource, it could mean several things. Certainly, typically it means time and space that is it must work in, in a limited time. Many of these are real time in nature they have small memory to use and of late one of the most scarce resources turned out to be power. We all are using mobile phones, handsets, tablets and so on and I am sure one common complaint most of us have for most of the gadgets that we use is I need my battery runs out very fast. In, irrespective of what system you use, irrespective of what use pattern you have, we are always very constrained on power. So, such software will have to be aware of such scarcity. The third is such software has to maintain integrity of millions of records. I mean if you have a software which manages uh, 100 students record or 200 bookings and so on, then it is not an industrial strength software, but it has to be hundreds of thousands, millions may be airline bookings, railway reservations and so on and so forth. It, the software could command and control real world entities writing like routing of airways, railway traffic and so on. Usually, they should have long time span. They should depend, many users would be depending on them. It will be critical for many users that these systems function properly. And more often, these are based on frameworks that simplify the creation of a domain specific application. This last point would become, if you are not aware of frameworks, then this will become more clear as we go through the course. But these factors, some of these or all of these factors decide that a software is industrial strength. So, there could be simple examples like. Uh, Indian Railway Reservation that uh, I am sure all of us have used is will be a candidate here. AutoCAD will be a candidate here, Word will be a candidate here and if you think through you will, you will see that they all match the requirements or characteristics that I am putting down here, but my split and merge program for transferring big binary files from one PC to the other will not be a candidate here. So, the complexity of industrial strength software systems are important to study primarily because the if you once you put all these conditions then their complexity exceed the human intellectual capability. It is impossible for any single individual or even for a small group of individuals to comprehend understand the system in totality. So, that is a very interesting scenario we are talking about building a system we are talking about building a software which nobody understands in full, but the software together works. 
So, that is where the challenge lies and it is those kind of software that we will be interested in and the development analysis design implementation techniques for those software can be facilitated by object oriented analysis and design and with those aspects we will study the course. So, when we will talk about a software henceforth it will always mean this kind of software. So, the basic point is the software is inherently complex, but we can look at this complexity in four different dimensions which are commonly known as elements of software complexity. The complexity of problem domain, difficulty of, so if you if I just highlight the complexity arising from problem domain, the difficulty of managing development processes, the flexibility that software offers, the fact that software is soft is the strength of software and that itself is a basic complexity and kind of works often as a weakness to the software. And finally, the behavior of discrete systems or the discrete event systems. So, what we will do is we will take each of these elements and try to see what does the complexity mean in regard to this system, these elements. So, first the complexity of problem domain. So, basically if you look at the scenario, then it is always a scenario of uh, two parties. On one side is the user of the software or the we in the industry we will typically call them as customers or clients and the other side is a developer or vendor who will develop the system. Certainly, the developer would have skills domain knowledge in software, but the user would come from her own domain of expertise requirements and to be able to develop the software, it is the requirement of the developer to understand the domain of the user. We we'll just uh, take some random examples, an electronic system of a multi engine aircraft. Now, it, you do not expect a software engineer to understand this electronic system. You do not even expect that software engineer to understand the engine of an aircraft or the kind of control that that engine requires or the issues that arise when there are multiple engines in an aircraft and the engines need to switch from on to off and speed controls and all that. So, it is a big challenge for the software developer to understand this domain, a different very different thing merchant shipping as uh, you would be aware that thousands and thousands of tons of freight is regularly transported across seas all around the world and big companies corporations manage that big ships manage that and that is the activity of merchant shipping. If you are asked to develop a software to manage merchant shipping or certain aspect of merchant shipping, I am not even talking about everything in merchant shipping. Certainly, you will find it very, very difficult because you do not understand that domain. Online trading and reconciliation, we use net banking, many of us may be using the online trading to trade on stock markets, but if you want to really develop the software, you will need to understand all the nuances of what happens when you place a transaction, when you place a buy or a sell order and how does it go through, what are the kind of synchronization that is required, what is said to be the match of a order the between buy and sell orders, how these are reconciliated how is money really is taken out from the bank account or traded to the bank account, how are DMATs operate and so on and so forth. So, I am just trying to randomly talk on different domains to make you understand that it is really difficult to understand the domain. The second issue with the complexity that comes from the problem domain is functional requirements are complex to master. In the background of the fact that you have not understood the domain. So, all that you have done is possibly skim through some pages that the customer has given you and then have done some blind search from Google to quickly educate yourself or familiarize yourself with some jargons of that domain. 
but when it comes to functional requirements. So, when you will say that uh, a day trade will have to be reconciliated within the EOD, you will not find it easy to really understand what this whole functionality means. So, they are complex to master and often the requirements are competing and contradictory. It they could as, as well be contradictory. Just a, a couple of days back, I have been sitting with a team uh, who develop uh, who are developing a digital library. This digital library should be available at a national level, several hundreds and thousands of people will use that. So, on one side the, the requirements of the security team is that each and every individual must be known to the system, each and every individual must have been authenticated through biometrics and so on to make sure that nobody misuses the library. The other side of the requirement, a different page of the requirement says that this is a national resource, this is a national asset. So, this digital library should be accessible to one and all in the country. So, you can easily make out that both of these are real requirements of the user, of the client. The client is being honest, but these requirements are contradictory, they are competing requirements. And this is just a simple example when you go to more and more complex domains, you have more and more complex uh, situations to deal with. The third, we have a lot of non-functional requirements in a software. By non-functional, what is meant is which is not evident. That is, is the software user friendly? It can be functionally good, but is it user friendly? Does it have a good performance? That is, does it perform the tasks? within the expected time. What is the cost of the software? How long will this software survive? Is it reliable? How often does it crash? So on and so forth. Non-functional requirements are very difficult to deal with because users do not understand non-functional requirements. So, when users will tell us the developers that this is what I need the user at best will give you a vague idea of a functional requirement in incorrect terms, but non-functional requirements most of the time the user will be silent about or will tell you something which is not at all very meaningful. So, the non-functional requirements are often implicit and since they are implicit when you will consider them in your design and say well this is the budget that you will need to put up the customer will come back strongly saying that well this is this is not justifiable. I am not getting any functionality in this. The customer will never understand why you want the software to survive 10 years and why there is a separate cost to make that software survive 10 years. The customer will say yes, I will get the software, I will use it for 10 years. So, these are some of the core difficulties that happen in the due to the complexity of the problem domain. Now, let us continue further. There is a there is a core notion and many people refer to is that external complexity, which is basically the starting point of any software development project. So, just think of the scenario there is on one side is the user, the customer who has some needs. So, has called the vendor, the developer has gone there. So, the first thing what has to happen the customer has to explain the requirements, the need to the developer. Now, in this, so this is a purely whatever way you do it, this is a human human communication process and we know that any place you make a communication, the first thing that happens is there is a gap in communication and the severe gap of communication between users and developers is one of the greatest bottlenecks of smooth development of software. The first thing is users cannot express, the other side is developers cannot understand. Users cannot express because users talk in their language, the language of the domain. Developers cannot understand because developers are software developers, they do not understand the language of the domain, they talk in the language of software. So, when a broker talks to a company that I need a back office management system for DMATs, the broker 
very fluently says that well, uh, these are the different kinds of uh, demats you will have and there should be a possibility, uh, you should support the pledging of demats and so on and so forth. To the software, poor software developer that is all Greek, the software does, developer does not understand what pledging a demat mean. On the other hand, when the software developer says that look, uh, you this has to be real time and so on. So, I will need this kind of a server, there will have to be such a network router boxes and so on. Certainly, the customer is totally at a loss as to what is this going on, where is my shares, where are my demats, where is my back office. So, the lack of expertise across domains is a major issue of communication gap and that gives rise to different perspectives on the nature of the problem. So, the perspectives of the developer and that of the customer, that of the user are very different in terms of what the problem is. The user sees one kind of a problem, the developer sees a different kind of a problem. The developer provides a solution to the problem that the developer sees and that is not the solution to the problem that the user sees. So, it is a complete, I mean it is a perfect recipe for disaster. Now, in this process to minimize the communication gap, unfortunately we have very few instruments and most projects till date work with large volumes of text written in natural language with some drawing at the best is all that we have. And certainly we know that even a simple sentence like I will go to your home tomorrow can be understood in several way, I will go to your home tomorrow, I will go to your home tomorrow, I will go to your home tomorrow, the same sentence, but we all understand it means different things. So, when a complex requirement is written down in terms of natural language, certainly it is open to several interpretations and developers more often make that interpretation which the user never meant. And this is one specific aspects which we will expand on significantly in this course and this will be the basis for, this lack of instrument is a basis for designing, using and promoting the unified modeling language, which is far away from any natural language, very close to diagrams. Diagrams, icons are what we understand universally, irrespective of culture, age, education and our mother tongue. So, but this remains to be a big uh, complexity of the problem domain and all these lead to the external complexity as I started saying. The next uh, issue is uh, what uh, I touched upon also a little bit in the in module 1 is changing and evolving requirements is a reality of software development and requirements change for two reasons for the on the user side the requirements keep on changing because more and more the software I see developed I understand actually what I needed. I understand that what I see is not what I needed, so I change the requirement. Even on the other side, on the developer side, more and more the developer develops, she starts becoming a better expert of the domain in which the software is being developed. So, after 5 months of 6 months of development, then the developer realizes, understands very clearly that there is only one kind of demat, everything else is a specialization hierarchy. where such and such and such can be done. Did not see that when this was introduced to her at the time of given the requirement. So, changing or evolving requirements is a reality which adds to a lot of complexity for the problem domain. Last but not the least is uh, software projects, large software projects have huge capital investment. So, when the requirements really change, when the scenarios really change, because the business situation may have changed, the business processes may have changed, the technology may have changed, it immediately does not remain practical to scrap the project, it gets unfeasible with these changing requirements. So, what we will have to do? We will have to somehow tweak around and make that old software work in the new way. More often, these uh, changes are referred to as maintenance and I agree with uh, Boch, uh, the author of this book, who says that no, this is not maintenance. 
true this is not maintenance is when you have errors in the software you correct that that is maintenance. But when genuinely you respond to changing requirements that is evolution and finally when you bend your back bend backwards to make the legacy software decaying software ancient software to fit the requirements of today somehow you are basically doing a software preservation. Naturally, the software preservation requires a inordinate percentage of effort by the developers and we need to also build techniques, we need to also make our processes such that we can not only analyze and design and implement, but we should be able to maintain, evolve and preserve the software using our techniques. So, when you focus on these, all these will have to be equally emphasized on. Let me now move on to the next uh, element of software complexity, that is difficulty of managing the development process. The whole why do we make software to solve problems? Why do we make software? So, that complex problems can be solved in simple terms. So, I need to do a do an analysis of a truss for building a bridge. I want to do a finite element analysis, which is a very complex process, but I should be able to do that with the press of a button. So, the reality of what we do and the illusion of that the software has to produce are very different. Software has to give an illusion that is very easy. MATLAB one instruction and you get the Fourier transform done, but that Fourier transform is a very complex mathematics. So, the software has to hide this external complexity, the gap between the domain and the instrument of delivery in the software, which results in the software is getting large in size, huge code bases. Complex software typically have the LOC, LOC stands for lines of code ranging from hundreds of thousand to a million or more. And this is given that we are not today not coding in assembly language or a low level language, we are coding in smart high level languages in spite of the fact that we will take all effort to reuse designs, reuse codes. But the fact remains that code base finally turns out to be so huge that it goes beyond the comprehension of a single individual or groups, even when we have done a very meaningful decomposition. So, what is the consequence? You need teams, you need teams, software cannot be developed by individuals or very small group of people. Teams preferably should be kept small, but you need teams and the moment you need teams, now you have a new dimension to software development, which is team development. If the team does not work, the software does not work. So, large code bases would mean more teams, more developers, you will not get more developers at one place, economics will come in, you will have more developers in more geographies, some in India, some in Brazil, some in Poland, some in US more developers will mean more complex interaction, more misunderstanding, more difficult coordination and the key management challenge will remain to be how do you maintain a unity, how do you maintain an integrity of the design of the software in spite of all these challenges. So, a huge amount of complexity is not from the technology or from the problem domain, it is from the process of development, because it is a human intensive, because it is a uh, process where the intellectual capability has to go in very strongly. I will stop here and take the remaining points separately.